All right, so since this is our last uh, class meeting, um, before we get started, I do want to give people one last chance to ask me any questions they have about anything at all um, within reason. Yeah, Frank. Um, what's the exact time, um, date of the exam again? Time? Uh, it's on Friday, the 2nd. And it's 10.30 to 12.30, I believe. Yes? Yes. So yes, that is when you have to be here. Um, I would like everybody to stay for the whole thing if they can. If you have another exam you have to go to, though, uh, please let me know. Right? Please don't just get up and leave. Um, so yeah, if you have someplace else to be, we will try to accommodate you as best we can. But you just have to let me know first. Um, anything else? Other questions about the paper, about the exam, about anything? Yes, Megan. Um, you emailed us about the makeup that we could do for the next yeah. We bring those in on the day of the exam, right? Yeah, bring that with you the day of the exam. Yep. And for most of you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you all the opportunity to, to make up one, right? For most of you, that's sufficient. Um, most of you did not have any sort of significant attendance problems uh, this semester, so um, only a couple of you actually even missed more than one in class writing. Uh, you have the list in your email of which ones you did miss, right? You can choose one to make up. Any other questions about anything at all? You said the time was 10.30 to 12.30? 10.30 to 12.30, yeah, two hours. So in order to make sure we get through everybody's and don't hold anybody up, uh, we will be keeping you strictly to time, right? So. I do not want anybody going over 20 minutes, right? This means that you're going to have to be selective about the material you present, right? So make sure that you are presenting only the most important of all of your points, right? The things that are really, really vital, you think, for your classmates to understand about your selected text. Um, the other thing I will say though, right, we do tend to talk a little bit faster when we're up in front of people, right? We all know this, everybody gets a little bit nervous when they're in front of an audience. So it's probably a good idea as you're going over your presentation, rehearsing it, to have maybe about 23, 24 minutes of material, right? To compensate for the fact that when you get up here, you will likely be talking a mile a minute, right? Try to take a few deep breaths and calm that impulse down, but you know, I, I understand it and I know, I know where it comes from. Um, anything else, other questions? Any other questions about the class at all? Can I ask something about your other class? Or maybe later? Yeah, why don't you uh, talk to me after class then? All right. Then, um, right, we all know when the final is. We all know when the paper's due. Um, I am available over email, and I do want to remind everybody also that I have extended office hours on Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, one more, th oh yeah, secret. Um, for the paper, mm -hmm. is there extra credit for writing? Yes, yes, on, yep. On any paper I assign for this class, you go to the writing center, you get extra credit. So if you have been, great, good, wonderful. If you haven't, it is in your best interest to go. Um, there was one thing I was about to say, and it slipped my mind. Yes, um, course evaluations. Only a few of you have done the course evaluations. Uh, they close on, they close tomorrow. So if you could please uh, go ahead and get that done, um, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, okay, so if there is nothing else, and it appears there is nothing else, all right, then let's talk about European encounters with the New World from the opposite perspective that we, of, to the one that we looked at last week. Right? Yeah, Regan. Yeah, that's OK, that's all right. Um, like, say we are using a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. How do you want to like, put it on your view? Or do you want to put it on the computer? Yeah, you can put it. Um, I find usually the easiest thing to do is put it on a thumb drive. Um, you can, you know, you can email it to yourself. Uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever's easiest for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I usually have, I usually have carry a thumb drive with me. That's, that's what I would recommend.
you know, it's also not a bad idea to have to back that up by emailing it to a member of the group in case someone loses the thumb drive. All right, so, right. European Encounters of the New World, yes. Last week we talked about um, the American perspective, right? The perspective of the Maya and the Aztecs after they'd first met the Spanish. Right, so today we're gonna to be talking about the way Europeans perceived and attempted to assimilate into their own cultural consciousness um, these new continents, no, you know, well, these continents that were new to them that they discovered, right? So when Christopher Columbus sails the ocean blue in 1492, just to briefly review, what is it that he actually learns? What I'm is it? India. What's that? I'm not in India. Uh, it, it's arguable whether he actually ever figured out that he hadn't landed in India. Um, it, he was certainly deluded about where he was for a very long time. Yeah, he wasn't actually a very good navigator, and he uh, severely underestimated the size of the Earth. In fact, he was actually lucky that he hit something on his way to India, because he would have run out of food and water. But so what did he actually demonstrate? What did, he, what did his voyage actually accomplish? Um, there's something we can reach to the east. Yeah, that they're actually uh, to the east. Of your, yeah, except you're going the wrong way, yeah. They already knew what was to the east, right? That it's not uninhabited, that there's people there in resources. Yeah, if we think back to Dante's vision of the world, right? Dante knew the world was round, right? Everybody knew the world was round for centuries. The idea that Columbus discovered that the world was round was propagated in the early 19th century by the American novelist Washington Irving. It has nothing whatsoever to do with actual history. What Columbus did demonstrate was that the <clears throat> world to the west was not simply empty ocean. That there was, in fact, something there, and that people lived there. And so what we have here is a woodcut illustration of Columbus's first meeting with the Taino people of the Caribbean. So I want you to, I'm, I'm going to turn one of the lights off so you can actually see this a little bit better. I just want you to, to study this picture for a moment and tell me what you notice in it that seems to you noteworthy. The giant cross. Okay, yeah, there's a giant cross going up on the edge of the land here, right? Good. Columbus is the Columbus and his men are the only ones with weapons. Okay, yeah. Columbus and his men are armed. Good. And the Indians are the only ones presenting gifts. Mm -hmm. Yep, the Taino are presenting gifts. And they're naked. And are naked. Whereas um, the Spaniards themselves do not look um, like they're dressed for the Caribbean, right? They are encased in metal and leather. So they are probably, if, they're, if they were actually wearing this when they landed, they're probably feeling very, very hot. What about the posture of the figures in the picture? What do you notice about the posture? Well, the Europeans seem confident, and the Tainos are kind of like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. They seem kind of cautious and wary. Yeah, they're kind of holding things out and backing off a little bit, right? Whereas Columbus and his men are sort of standing ramrod straight. You know, Colum well, the men are standing ramrod straight. Columbus is casually leaning on a spear, right? They can see they've got superior force. And yeah, the Taino look much more cautious. We see some of them running away here as well in the background as Columbus's men land. Now, do you notice anything weird about the physical depiction here of the Taino, or of the objects they're holding. The objects they're holding look like they're well-made and well-crafted. Yeah. Far well, beyond what they want to actually be capable of. 
Well, it's, it's not that they weren't capable of good craftsmanship, but this is not, these are not objects that you would typically have found in a village in the Caribbean, right? Their faces aren't, I don't know, they look a lot like Columbus. So yeah. They look European. Physically, they look, yeah, physically they're drawn to look European, right? Their hairstyle looks European. Their facial features look European. Their body proportions look, look vaguely European. Now, the objects they're holding as well, you know, they, the Taino did not make things out of metal, right? So we've got here, you know, like this sort of, you know, golden gift box here, this gold chalice, you know, they've got these, um, you know, amulets, these necklaces they're holding out, right? Which would not be the sorts of objects they would have made, they would have owned. So one thing that we see here is that in dealing with this new and unfamiliar world, European artists and European writers tended to try to assimilate it to that which was already familiar to them. You don't see this as much in European depictions of Asia and Africa from the same period because those were not completely unknown, completely unfamiliar places. But you will see, typically, in European depictions of American Indians from the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, um, they look almost, like their proportions look almost like Greek or Roman statuary. The poses that they're in are typical of Greek and Roman statuary, right? Essentially, the artists are depicting them in the way they've been trained to depict the human body. And they're just trying to, to, trying to assimilate a new type of person to it. In fact, what's really the only the only two what are really the only two things that mark a difference here between Columbus and his men and the Taino in this picture? Yeah, the clothing and the sort of gift giving posture, right? The lack of clothing is supposed to mark the Taino as un, is what's supposed to mark the Taino as uncivilized, right? So rather than depicting physical difference, what's usually depicted in art of this period is uh, cultural difference, right? Through, through dress or what have you. Um, to give you another example of a similar phenomenon, um, the leader of the Roanoke colonists uh, was a guy by the name of John White. And White was also trained as an artist. So he made a number of sketches um, and watercolor paintings of the Native Americans of what is now Virginia. And so again, we have here um, a figure whose proportions are those of a Roman statue, whose pose is that of a Roman statue. Um, he's getting the sort of cultural accoutrements a little bit more right than the woodcut artist is because he's actually seen them, whereas the guy making that woodcut would have been just sort of doing so in Europe based on hearsay and description. Um, but this attempt to assimilate new experience by means of that which is already familiar expresses itself in a couple of different ways in the three short pieces I wanted you to read for today. Right? First, if we look at Columbus's letter, how does Columbus seem to view his discovery. What does he see, what, what seems to him most important about it? Oh. Okay, why'd you say the resources, Sarah? He talks about the gold and the spices and how it would be easy to take it. Well, okay. it makes it seem like it would be uh -huh. easy to take it because he, the he way he describes it. numerous times, day. these people are, you know, they do not, they merely are frightened to us when they come mm -hmm. back, they're friendly. They have no weapons, they have no iron, they have no steel. Even mm -hmm. they did try and attack us once, these people had no weapons and they stopped. Okay. So yeah, when he talks about the people, that seems to be his focus, right? That they're timid, they're barely armed, 
and it would probably be really, really easy to conquer this place because they're constantly giving us stuff, right? So he depicts them as kind of weak and servile, right? That they're immediately submissive, you know, once they get over their initial fear, they're immediately submissive. Or if you look on page 1923, or 1920, start, let's start on 1922. Bottom of the page. The people of this island, and of all the others that I have found and seen, or not seen, all go naked, men and women, just as their mothers bring them forth. Although some women cover a single place in the leaf of a plant, or a cotton something which they make for that purpose, they have no iron or steel, nor any weapons, nor are they fit thereunto, not because they be not a well-formed people in a fair stature, but that they are most wondrously timorous." Right? So they're well-formed, they're well-proportioned, they're strong, but they're cowardly. Why would Columbus be, want to point out to the king and queen who sponsored his voyage that these people are actually strong and well-proportioned, if cowardly? They can work. Yes. They can't fight, but they can work. We can put them to work. They have no iron and steel. Uh, right. They have no other weapons than the stems of reeds in their seeding state, on the end of which they fix little sharpened stakes. Even these they dare not use. For many times has it happened that I sent two or three men ashore to some village to parley, and countless numbers of them sallied forth, but as soon as they saw those approach, they fled away in such wise that even a father would not wait for his son. Now, if you had never seen a horse or a man in armor or a big wooden ship, and suddenly, all of these things show up on your doorstep, like right outside your village. Would you want to stick around and throw your little reed spear at it? Well, of course you'd be freaking terrible. You know, it, it, would, it would be like, you know, you know, it would be like the P-Funk mothership landing in your backyard, right? This is, yeah, this is, you know, potentially frightening, right? This is like, you know, like, you know, aliens coming. <clears throat> to take over your land. This is, you know, these are, the Taino are having a hard time assimilating the Spaniards to their experience, right? They've never seen anything like this before. So of course they run away. And Columbus reads this as evidence of weakness and cowardice. And this was not because any hurt had ever been done to any of them. On the contrary, at every headland where I've, I, I gave, uh, at, at every headland where I have gone and been able to hold speech with them, I gave them of everything which I had, as well as cloth and many other things, without accepting aught therefore. But such they are, incurably timid. It is true that since they have become more assured and are losing that terror, they are artless and generous with what they have to such a degree as no one would believe but him who has seen it. Of anything they have, if it be asked for, they never say no but do rather invite the person to accept it and show as much lovingness as though they would give their hearts. Now, does this look familiar at all? The idea that when strangers come to your home, you should give them things. Bless you. Yeah, that Greek ideal of hospitality, right? And, you know, the idea of hospitality, the Greeks tended to regard it as specifically theirs, but it's really not as culturally specific as they believed it was. You see it in a lot of traditionalist cultures. I mean, like, hell, there are places where today, you know, like, if you happen to be wandering, for example, you know, in a rural area in various parts of the Middle East, you know, if you're just going by someone ha someone's house, they will invite you in for coffee, right? That's what you're expected to do. You're expected to show hospitality to the stranger. And that's exactly what these people are doing. Okay, these strangers have showed up, you know, we've realized they're human beings. They're not, you know, monsters encased in metal. So we'll give them things. And does Columbus read this hospitality as a virtue? What is it a sign of for him? Providence. What do you mean by providence? Well, the belief in providence is the idea that um, that this was something made for them by God. Mm -hmm. So if it was made for them by God, it was providence that they would meet these people who would welcome them in. 
that sounds a little bit more Protestant than um, Columbus probably would have. Columbus's beliefs probably would have. Columbus was an ardent Catholic. Um, that particular idea is, I think, something that comes in a little bit later with English explorers and with French Huguenots. Yeah, that's certainly what the Puritans would have would have uh, would have believed. Um, Columbus is looking at this rather as something that can be exploited. That's an opportunity. Exactly. This is an opportunity. This is a sign of weakness. This is a sign that these people, yeah, exactly, these people and their land can in fact be very, very profitable for us. And in fact, when he's first describing the land, does that sound at all familiar to you? If we look at this island that he's found, the physical description he gives of it, If you look on page 1922, I understood sufficiently from other Indians who might already taken that this land, in its continuousness, was an island. And so I followed its course eastwardly for 107 leagues as far as where it terminated, from which headland I saw another island to the east, 18 leagues distant from this, to which I at once gave the name La Española. And I proceeded thither and followed the northern coast as with Luana. Eastwardly for 188 great leagues in a direct easterly course as with Luana. The which and all the others are most fertile to an excessive degree, and this extremely so. In it, there are many havens on the sea coast, incomparable with any others that I know in Christendom, and plenty of rivers so good and great that it is a marvel. The lands thereof are high, and in it are many ranges of hills, and most lofty mountains incomparably beyond the island of Tenerife, all most beautiful in a thousand shapes and all accessible and full of trees of a thousand kinds, so lofty that they seem to reach the sky. And I am assured that they never lose their foliage, as may be imagined, since I saw them as green and as beautiful as they are in Spain during May. And some of them were in flower, some in fruit, some in another stage according to their kind. And the nightingale was singing and other birds of a thousand sorts in the month of November, there where I was going. There are palm trees of six or eight species, wondrous for to see for their beautiful variety, but so are the other trees, fruits, and plants therein. There are wonderful pine groves, and very large plains of verdure, and there is honey, and many kinds of birds, and many various fruits. In the earth there are many mines of metals, and there is a population of incalculable number." So what is he reading this place in terms of before he actually gets to talking about the people? It's resources and its material wealth. Yep, resources. Have we seen a fictional character do a similar kind of read of the landscape when he first shows up there? Odysseus. Yeah, he's doing really kind of exactly the sort of thing Odysseus does when he comes to a new island, right? He looks it over, he sees what use it could be put to and whether it's being used or not, right? And then looks for signs of civilization. Columbus is primarily concerned with that use it can be put to part, right? And even the signs of civilization, even the people there, count amongst the resources of the place. Right, so his primary interest here, like where Odysseus's primary interest was survival, right? Hospitality was something that could help him in that particular goal, right? Can I survive on this island? Will the people here help me get home? What Columbus is thinking is less about survival and more about conquest. How do I take this over? What use do I put this to? And Columbus never came to North America, right? The island that he's talking about, um, which he calls La Española, is the island we now call Hispaniola. It's the island on which uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic are located. And Columbus did, in fact, come back, um, <clears throat> was made governor of this place by the Spanish, um, and put the native population to work 
uh, mining for metals. And, worked them all to death. and yes, he, he worked them all to death. Um, his brothers uh, took terrible advantage of the Taino women. They proved to be uh, vulnerable to European diseases, um, right? You know, illnesses like uh, smallpox, for example, were unknown in the Americas before Europeans brought them there. And so, there really are no Taino anymore. Right? As a result of this encounter, the people Columbus encountered died out. So what we have here in Columbus's example is an encounter in which the non-European culture meets its doom through this encounter, right? And we can see the seeds of this in Columbus's language of exploitation, right, of resources, human as well as, you know, mineral and vegetable. Now, how is the Cortez letter different? What's the difference between Cortez's situation and Columbus's? dealing with nice, so we're going to, people who wouldn't be able to fight back. Yeah, the Aztecs whom Cortez encounters are a military power, right? This is an empire of city builders. So the Aztecs are certainly less passive than the Taino were, at least in their depiction, or at least in the way they're depicted uh, by Cortez. Now, what's similar about Cortez's encounter? What, what does it have in common with Columbus's encounter with the Taino? How is Cortez received by the Aztecs when he first appears? Yeah, lots of gifts, right? But are the Aztecs the only ones who give gifts in this situation? If we look on page 1927, right, we get a description of the reception Cortez receives when he comes to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan which is uh, where Mexico City is now. I accordingly proceeded along this causeway and half a league from the city of Tenochtitlan itself at the point where another causeway from the mainland joins it. I came upon an extremely powerful fort with two towers surrounded by a six foot wall with a battlement running around the whole of the side abutting on the two causeways and having two gates and no more for going in and out. Here, nearly a thousand of the chief citizens came out to greet me, all dressed alike and, as their custom is, very richly. On coming to speak with me, each performed a ceremony very common among them, to wit, placing his hand on the ground and then kissing it, so that for nearly an hour I stood while they performed this ceremony. So two things to note here, right? One, defensive array, right? Towers, battlements, these are people who can defend themselves. What about this ritual of welcoming with the thousand chief citizens all dressed alike performing this gesture for over an hour. What does this tell, uh, bless you, what does this tell us about the people Cortez's meeting and their society? Very yeah, they're not a, yeah, they're, they, they, they're showing no fear of him. And yeah, they are culturally sophisticated, right? They have complex social rituals in addition to, you know, impressive buildings. When we had passed this bridge, 
Moctezuma himself came out to meet us with some 200 nobles, all barefoot and dressed in some kind of uniform also very rich, in fact more so than the others. They came forward in two long lines keeping close to the walls of the street, which is very broad and fine, and so straight that one can see from one end of it to the other. Though it is uh, some two-thirds of a league in length and lined on both sides with very beautiful large houses, both private dwellings and temples. Moctezuma himself was borne along in the middle of the street with two lords on his right hand and on his left. All three were dressed in similar fashion, except that Moctezuma wore, sh wore shoes, whereas the others were barefoot. The two lords bore him along, each by an arm, and as he drew near, I dismounted and advanced alone to embrace, but the two lords prevented me from touching him. And they themselves made me the same obeisance as did their comrades kissing the earth. After he had spoken to me, all the other lords who were in the two long lines came up likewise in order one after the other and then reformed in line again. And while I was speaking to Moctezuma, I took off a necklace of pearls which I was wearing and threw it round his neck. Whereupon, having proceeded some little way up the street, a servant of his came back to me with two necklaces wrapped up in a napkin made from the cells of, she of sea snails, which are very much prized by them. And from each necklace hung eight prawns fashioned very beautifully in gold, some six inches in length. The messenger who brought them put them round my neck, and we then continued up the street in the manner described until we came to a large and very handsome house which Moctezuma had prepared for our lodging. So what does Cortez give here? Yeah, he gives one necklace of pearls, right, as evidence of good faith. What does Moctezuma give him in return? Two necklaces. Yeah, double the necklaces, right, with heavy gold prawns hanging off of them, right? So what is Moctezuma indicating here to Cortez? Is this, is his gift a gesture of submission? No, he's saying I, I don't need it. Yeah. That I've got plenty of money. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's showing off, right? Demonstrating to Cortez his wealth and power. Right? How cute. You give me a little necklace of pearls, right? Here, let me show you what I can give you. Right? We don't need your little necklace of pearls. Then he took me by the hand and led me to a large room opposite the patio by which we had entered. And seating me on a dais very richly worked, for it was intended for royal use, he bade me await him there and took his departure. So he brings Cortez into a room and seats him on a throne. Again, is this a gesture of submission? No. Showing you how powerful he is. It's his throne, it's his city. And yeah. I'm going to let you sit on my throne because I'm not afraid of you. You can't take this from me. Go ahead and try. So <clears throat> the people here that Cortez is dealing with are very, very different from the Taino that Columbus has spoken to, right? But Cortez can only read this situation in terms of his own experience. And so he reads many of these situations as gestures of submission on Moctezuma's part. He thinks Moctezuma is giving him power over the city. When in fact, Moctezuma is, according to the customs of his people, in a way mocking Cortez. Now we know from looking at the Florentine Codex that Moctezuma actually was terrified by the coming of these people. But he's actually doing his best here not to display it. Right, this display of power, this display of wealth, this lack of this apparent lack of fear is meant to sort of put the invaders off. Now, when Cortez describes the city itself, what does he describe it in terms of? Or what does he compare it to? Yeah. It's much like the, uh, you know, the markets in, you know, the Silk Exchange in Granada, right? It's much like the market in Salamanca, right? He compares it to Spanish cities because this is what he knows, right? He's trying to place this in a framework that he knows and a framework that the king he's writing back to is familiar with. 
This is also why he constantly describes the temples of the Aztecs as mosques. Right? He doesn't really know what to call these things. Right? He knows what a mosque is. A Spaniard knows what a mosque is. Right? They know it's, okay, this isn't a church. I can't call it a church. It's not a house of Christian worship. Uh, so let's call it a mosque. Right? The king knows what that is. The king knows what this word means. And it's here that he really gets himself in trouble. How is it that he manages to turn the Aztecs firmly against him? Redecorated. <laughs> yeah, the, the redecorating of their temple, yes. Um, if you look on page 1932, there are three large halls in the Great Mosque where the principal idols are to be found, all of immense size and height, and richly decorated with sculptured figures both in wood and stone. And within these halls are other smaller temples branching off from them and entered by doors so small that no daylight ever reaches them. Certain of the priests, but not all, are permitted to enter, and within are the great heads and figures of idols. Although, as I have said, there are also many outside. The greatest of these idols, and those in which they place the most faith and trust, I ordered to be dragged from their places and flung down the stairs. Which done, I had the temples which they occupy cleansed, for they were full of the blood of human victims who had been sacrificed, and placed in them the image of Our Lady and other saints. All of which made no small impression upon Moctezuma and the inhabitants. Now, okay, first off, uh, before I get um, talking about this in any sort of detail, right? Once again, I want to reiterate that I am not trying to excuse the practice of human sacrifice or, you know, suggest that this is something the Aztecs should have been allowed to just keep on doing um, for as long as they wanted to. Um, however, the idea of sacrifice was kind of deeply ingrained in their belief system. They believed that the gods had sacrificed pieces of themselves to create the world. Right? For example, the god Tezcatlipoca had cut off his own foot in order to help create the world that we live in. That the god Nanautzen had actually sacrificed his entire body in order to become the sun. So since the gods had sacrificed themselves, had given of themselves, of their bodies, to create the world, they required the bodies of their, you know, their human servants to help continue it, to help keep it going. So when Cortez is dragging down these idols, right, he's dragging these idols down in front of people who genuinely believe that if they stop sacrificing hearts to Huitzipotli, that the sun is going to go out. Right? That everything they know is going to vanish. That the gods only sustain them as long as they make sacrifices. So of course they're going to be terrified, right? Of course they're going to be upset. Right. All Cortez sees is a religious practice he finds abhorrent. He does not make any effort to understand how it relates to the Aztec belief system. Right? He sees a belief system he does not share that engages in some practices that he finds, that, that he finds disgusting, that he finds wicked. And so, overnight, he decides, I'm just going to change their religion. We'll drag down the idols and we'll put up images of saints in their place. And everything's going to be okay, right? Of course, they're just going to follow along. So much of the strife between indigenous peoples in the Americas and the Europeans who come on voyages of discovery and conquest results from these kinds of misunderstandings. 
right, that essentially the European uh, visitors make no real attempt to understand the cultures or belief systems of the people they've just met um, on their own terms. Essentially, they don't behave as guests. Now, Cortez was not actually supposed to conquer the Aztecs. This, these were not his orders. He was in Mexico purely on a diplomatic mission. So, in part, his letter is an attempt to justify to the king of Spain why he disobeyed his orders and what the end result was. So he's also selling to the king the fact that he has just conquered a very wealthy city that's full of resources, that's full of great stuff, and that already has some things in common with Europe anyway, right? So everything's going to be great here. Now I do want to finally look at the Michel de Montaigne essay, uh, which is the only attempt we see here in these three texts um, to understand these indigenous cultures in any way on their own terms. Right now, what do you expect when you read the title of Cannibals? What do you expect he's going to be talking about? Or what do you expect his approach is going to be? Yeah. You, you imagine that he is going to express disgust over the practice of cannibalism, or you know, the practice of human beings eating each other. And is his primary attitude towards this act one of disgust? What does he seek to do instead? Yeah, secret. In my perspective of the text, it seems as if he understands them, mm -hmm. and as though many of his um, peers and rivals may say they are very in ways, yeah. he kind of challenges his sins, and though he's understand their customs, they don't mm -hmm. know what he's wrong and what he's right, because they've been doing it for so many years. Mm -hmm. So he kind of seeks to, he seeks tolerance, yeah, like protecting and justification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, he may not approve of the action itself, right? Yeah he does at least try to understand why they do it and how it fits into their conception of the world, right? For one thing, he is talking here about a specific group of people. He's talking about a specific tribe in Brazil called the Tupanaba. And the Tupanaba had a peculiar ritual um, <clears throat> prisoners captured in war who were going to be eaten by their captors would engage in this sort of bad, I mean, you know, they'd be by and large well treated until they were, until they were a meal. Um, <clears throat> but you know, they'd sort of be you know, kept in the village, you know, sort of, in, you know, restrained in a wicker cage. And, uh, they would sing songs that taunted their captors. You know, essentially along the lines of, along the lines of, well, when you eat me, you will eat all of your fathers and brothers and grandfathers that I have ingested, right? And then the, the captors would sing taunting songs back at him, this sort of long back and forth ritual um, in which the, uh, the victim actually kind of gets to have his say. Um, and it was really sort of, it was very complex and formulaic. And this is something that Montaigne does sort of reference briefly, right? But he gives us, he, he, he gives them a motive. For doing this, right? If we look on page 1654, these nations then, seem to me barbarous in this sense, that they have been fashioned very little by the human mind and are still very close to their original naturalness. The laws of nature still rule them, very little corrupted by ours, and they are in such a state of purity that I am sometimes vexed that they were unknown earlier, in the days when men were able to judge them better than we. So he's setting up a binary here, right? And what's the binary? 
that he sets up between Europeans and Brazilians. What are Europeans ruled by, according to Montaigne? Nature. Europeans? Oh, no, never mind. Inventions. <laughs> Pardon? Inventions. Yeah, um, invention, reason, logic, law, right? You know, ruled by, as he says here, sort of, you know, the, the things of the mind. And he opposes that to nature, right? What we're getting here in Montaigne's essay is an early sketch of the idea of what comes to be called the noble savage. Right? There's a strand in philosophy that suggests that civilization, education, the trappings of sophisticated society, technology, all of these things um, are actually uh, <clears throat> influences that malform the human soul. Right? That these are baneful influences on us. They're bad. Living in society, sophisticated, cultured, urban society hurts us. And that they look to what they regard as primitive societies, as, as sort of exemplars of virtues they feel civilized man has lost. All right, we call this the noble savage tradition. Now, this, this often comes um, from a kind of unsophisticated reading of the kinds of cultures they're talking about. The fact that a group of people is not technologically sophisticated doesn't mean they aren't sophisticated in other ways. The fact that um, a particular group of people doesn't read or write doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a, long body, a large body of, say, oral lore, right? As we saw um, when we looked at that oral epic from Mali, right? So Montaigne is one of the progenitors of this idea of the noble savage, right? That we can look to cultures that are not technologically advanced, that are not socially sophisticated um, in order to regain virtues that Western man has lost. And what virtues does he attribute to the Tupanamba? What do they have that he feels Europeans have lost? What do they gain by being closer to nature? I am sorry that Lycurgus and Plato did not know of them, for it seems to me that what we actually see in these nations surpasses not only all the pictures in which poets have idealized the golden age and all their inventions in imagining a happy state of man, but also the conceptions and the very desire of philosophy. They could not imagine a naturalness so pure and simple as we see by experience, nor could they believe that our society could be maintained with so little artifice and human solder. This is a nation, I should say to Plato, in which there is no sort of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no science of numbers, no name for a magistrate or for political superiority, no custom of servitude, no riches or poverty, no contracts, no successions, no partitions, no, no occupations, but leisure ones, no care for any but common kinship, no clothes, no agriculture, no metal, no use of wine or wheat. The very words that signify lying, treachery, dissimulation, avarice, envy, belittling pardon, unheard of. How far from this perfection would he find the republic that he imagined? Men fresh sprung from the gods. These manners nature first ordained. So one thing that Montaigne is doing here is participating in a particular kind of discourse about the new world that even a relatively enlightened relativist like himself, who's trying to understand um, a culture from the inside out, can't help but fall into it. Right? When he talks about the golden age here, right, he imagines that indigenous societies in the Americas exist sort of at an earlier point in the historical continuum 
than Europe does, right? That they simply have not advanced historically. He doesn't take into account, again, the fact that they may have advanced in other ways that Europeans didn't. But for a lot of Europeans, the New World becomes a kind of Eden or paradise where one can go to start over, where one can go to get back in touch with the natural world, with natural life, with a more natural social order. And this is also directly connected to the Odyssey. It's funny how the Odyssey keeps creeping into um, most many of these uh, tales of exploration and conquest in the 16th century. Now part of this is because it would have been part of the common education of a gentleman. Um, if you were an educated person, you knew Homer. That was just the, the way things were. But in particular on the island of the Cyclopes, right, on the one hand we have giant cannibals, What else do the Cyclopes have on their island? Goats. They got goats. They got lots of goats and sheep. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, the, I can't remember now. They have this <laughs> amazingly fertile land, right, that just produces on its own without effort. Much like the way the Greeks and Romans described the golden age before the coming of the new gods. Right? When the Titans ruled in the golden age, fruit just fell off the trees into your hand. Right? When Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden, they could eat of any tree, they could eat whatever they wanted except that one forbidden tree, right? And they didn't have to worry about anything. Right? There's no death, there's no fear, everything's great, everything's hunky-dory. You look like you want to say something, yeah. Um He talks about uh, fruit mm -hmm. um, on page 1653. Yeah. And he says, where is it? And yet for all that, the savor and delicacy of some un uncultivated fruits uh -huh. of those countries is quite, ex is quite as excellent, even to our taste, as that of our own. Uh -huh. It's not reasonable that art should win the place of honor over our great and powerful mother nature. It's like, he talks about, you know, the fruit, which goes back to Eden and paradise. Sure. And he also talks about it from, like, you know, the binary, like a mind mm -hmm. versus nature sort of yeah. perspective. Yeah. So it's like, you have both just in a small paragraph. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the wild fruit. The uncultivated fruit that just grows on its own is better than what you grow in an orchard, is what he's saying, right? Mm -hmm. That nature is better than artifice. And he even uses terms like reasonable, mm -hmm. which would be something that Europeans would, you know, go yeah. for. Yeah, and especially sort of the you know, 17th and 18th centuries, sort of that worship of reason and logic. So. Even attempt, so but the point I'm getting at here is that even attempts to um, understand the new world on its own terms still tend to end up framing it in terms of familiar European ideas and familiar European tropes, uh, religious and mythological. So all three of these writers, what they share is that their attempts to understand cultures across the ocean are marred by the fact that they can't think about them in any terms other than the familiar. Essentially, they have to sort of assimilate them into what they already know because they've not experienced anything quite like this before. All right, Does any, we're, we're running short on time. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, so I have some in-class writings to give back to you. And again, like I, I do just, you know, I, 
you know, I want to thank this group one more. Like, you guys have actually have really been great uh, this semester. I have really enjoyed working with this class. Um, and uh, I hope that you feel like you've got something out of this. I hope you've enjoyed this as well. Okay, so make sure you turn in your last in-class writing. <laughs> 